My name is Emmanuel Agbeko Gamor. I'm from Ghana and I'm the co-founder of Edukania, an edtech startup based in the Chimalonghong precinct in Johannesburg, South Africa. I recently moved to South Africa because I was enrolled in a Master's in Management Innovation Studies program at Vitz Business School. I uh, reached a stage of my life where I wanted to understand and grapple innovation within enterprise. So beyond just entrepreneurship, how do we create an ecosystem that sustains businesses and makes them sustainable over the, gen over the years? So Kanea, Kanea means light, um, and so it's an ed startup. I started with um, Zinkle, Zinkle Nkabela. We met at Africa Leadership University, and the idea really is to create a learning experience uh, through human interaction. What are the ways that, especially in non-academic um, spaces, how can we translate information um, so that it carries on? Some of the things that you take away, um, you learn through experience. Uh, so we're looking at what are the learning journeys or playbooks that are translated and contextualized within our language, right? within the ways that we listen, auditory experientials that make sense for, for people. Um, it's been something that we talked about last year. Um, we had a chance to set it up May of this year. Um, we're incredibly excited to be incubated at the Tsimilahong precinct here in Joburg. Um, we've had so many partnerships um, speaking to what are the ways in which um, non-academic spaces, learnings and lessons from that, especially when we commune. So in African culture, we commune and sit down and we, have, we, we share information and we speak to that. How do we codify that and then how do we create a community um, that creates a learning journey so people can benefit from that? Uh, so that's what we're, we're, we've been doing and we're incredibly excited about it. Oh man, um, so before I started Kanea, um, I was teaching entrepreneurial leadership, uh, facilitating that for the first freshman year, first year class at Africa Leadership University, um, the Mauritius campus. Um, since I've been there, we also have the Rwanda campus. Uh, and it was an amazing experience um, to have students from over 30 plus countries um, in the same place in Mauritius and also thinking about the flipped classroom model. Um, so the model that we had was a way for students to kind of um, have self-learning on certain topics and then guided with facilitators and with bringing our authentic selves and experiential learning on how they could become better entrepreneurs. So the idea was to have a leadership core um, that included entrepreneurial leadership, project management, communicating for impact, um, and then be able to have other whatever their specialized degrees were, whether it was business management, uh, computer science, um, or engineering on top of that so that they could become entrepreneurial leaders. Ah, um, I think the African ecosystem is incredibly ready for innovation. Um, and the reason why is because, um, and that's the reason why I actually enrolled at an African university, at Wits University, versus going back to the States where I did my undergrad or going to Europe. Because um, I believe that innovation is everywhere. It's actually the commercialization um, and bringing to the fore or general public of innovation that we still have to manage, master, um, and make and add commercial value. Um, for us, our continent has been deemed many things. Uh, we're looking at different metrics, whether it's underdeveloped because of gross domestic, um, domestic product or GDP ratings, or whether it's um, the lapse in being digitally enabled as has been established. But what we forget is that we're innovative because we've been surviving and we've been able to survive in spite of um, institutional um, challenges and oppression and colonization. What is very interesting is that there have been so many things that have been found in other places of the world, including the continent, but then they've been commercialized in places like the United States because of the opportunity to scale and because of a financial market that allows people to invest heavily in an innovation regardless of the failure rate. Um, our continent is very ready for innovation because we're learning these practices. We're learning financial uh, models. We're learning about um, funds that enable uh, what you would call indigenous innovation, which really is undiscovered or not commercialized by the other people um, but we're also learning that we're finding a voice so the advent of mobile technology the advent of internet and access is allowing us to share things that we've known and have been doing over centuries in ways that make sense and looking for global partners in order to commercialize it for it to become something that's used in everyday life So in comparison to more developed societies like the US or 
or Europe, particularly with financial ins instruments that are more mature, how do we get Africans to, to take more riskier bets? Um, I think it's a muscle. And I think one of the things that we forget is that the way in which innovation now um, is set up, so having a Silicon Valley, for example, or having proprietary laws, um, having licensing um, opportunities, these were not n necessarily native to our way of practicing or innovating. Um, we were very much um, a culture of giving for free and not necessarily commercializing, right? Um, what, there's, a, there's a chain of thought that once we understand these finance models that unlock um, opportunities and funding and innovation, we're not as far back as we think. We're actually advanced in different ways. Um, what it takes, though, is codifying our innovative practices, codifying things that we're finding absent. For example, in the fourth industrial revolution, where the internet or the internet of things dictates on how we interact and use things, there are lots of metrics that are missing. Empathy. Um, diversity, appreciation of culture, practices. And if you look to that, you can find all of these things expressing themselves daily freely um, in African societies and everywhere else. Um, speaking of investment, I think that what's happened, and it's with any group of people, um, for us on the continent, we've invested in things that can give immediate returns because we've been living on survival. Um, one of the things that we've learned over time is exercising that muscle. So for example, if you'd like to extrapolate philanthropy, those who are philanthropists have practiced the art of philanthropy and they give away because they can get intrinsic value without getting returns back. The same thing happens with people who become uh, venture capitalists or fund managers. By getting a reward over time, they practice that muscle. Uh, so we've started to see some um, Africans do this. Tony Alumalo, Nigeria, um, Dan Gote, those with excess funds, Strive Masiwa as entrepreneurs, startup funds, but not just startup funds, be particularly targeting in who the funds go to, and it's the youth. So it's not just about starting a fund that supports a firm or an already established um, businesses, but it's starting up funds that takes the, the biggest risk on young ideas. That's what becomes innovative, right? Um, so yes, it doesn't seem to express itself the way it does in the West, but don't be fooled. I think that we're, we're getting to practice once we understand those, those markets. And the more people that practice that, the more we're able to see that we do already have um, innovative things that we can bring to the fore. We do have success stories. The other thing also is uh, Silicon Valley wasn't built overnight. Most of the industries that were built were traditionally for wartime innovation. Most of the things that we use now that are commercialized, be it the internet, smartphones, were innovation during times of conflict. So they had scientists working in life or death situations to do that. Um, we did not participate in that type of innovation. So there is a catch up of sorts that needs to happen. But that being said, even in the advent of us being in a space that seems to be crowded with these innovation and being in a relay race where we're just getting the baton, we're showing so much promise. A part of that is also because Africans are global. We have so many um, brilliant Africans who are in some of these tech uh, spaces. Some of them have also been inventors of whether it's fiber optics or pieces of these innovations. Uh, Elon Musk happens to be a South African beacon that we speak of that is really pushing the envelope. So in the right environment, it doesn't really matter where you're from. It's just who, who takes a bet on your idea and then how do we groom African people from every African country to actually believe in those ideas so they become sustainable. Um, so we've looked at over the past 10 to 15 years, what is the venture capital structure? So what is the private equity market? Are there people willing to put up money for that? Um, by numbers, no, because of structure. So part of it has to be government policy and law. And when it's put into policy, the other part has to be implementing bodies. So who has access to most of the money? A lot of it we're seeing now are banks. Are they willing to take risks on having that money? So our savings that we have generally goes to banks and banks would create some type of lending instrument, but they're not designed to take a risk, for example, on seed funding, for example, on angel investing, for example, on entrepreneurs um, that are coming up with new ideas. And the thing about new ideas is that they're supposed to be risky. If they weren't, they wouldn't be new. So there's, there is a little bit of catch up on financing available um, for seed funding, but what is also very encouraging is there's a whole cohort of young people who are, are finance minds, uh, of people who are listening and saying, wait a minute, within microfinance space, um, taking on Kiva's model, and, and look, taking on social entrepreneurship space, taking on angel investment, are there ways that we can channel money in order to help entrepreneurs get a start so that 
From that initial idea to the transition stage before their products become mature, they're encouraged. Um, they're also participating in a network. So sometimes people say, all I need is some money, right? Odds are the money is what you would scale or keep you going, but what you actually need is a network of mentorship, skills, feedback loop of potential customers to actually validate your product. Uh, so sometimes we speak of money because it seems as if money rules the world, but it's the ecosystem. Um, and I'm incredibly encouraged that we're creating an ecosystem, not just in South Africa. We have Beacons, Nairobi, um, Rwanda is doing some good work, uh, Lagos is doing some good work, Accra is doing some good work, Cape Verde. Uh, there's actually an African Innovation Summit that happens annually and, and moves from country to country in order to create this ecosystem that has government, private enterprise, and entrepreneurs entrepreneurs intersecting together so that way the ecosystem that allows for funding to be unlocked to happen. I think the biggest thing, um, and I'd say this particularly because I'm, I'm a millennial, and one of the things that we've been asked to be conscious of as we're inundated with the internet and everybody else's culture, um, it's just our heritage. Who we are, um, it helps determine where we're going. Uh, and I think that for all of us, and regardless of which part of the continent you are, whether it's from Egypt, uh, whether it's from Limpopo, whether it's, it's from Kumase, we are a people who, are, who come from something. We come from something that's beautiful, we come from a heritage and a legacy that's powerful. Um, and we need to be not just necessarily reminding people of it, but we need to be creating that world heritage that speaks to where we're coming from. So there's a quote that says that we stand, we stand on the shoulders of giants. It's, it's probably more, most profound here on the continent because you know what our interactions are like with our families, with our extended family. We express that even in how we live to this day. I still have my parents and my mom who reprimands me on how I look and, and how, what my haircut should be like. It speaks to that legacy invested interest. And I think for us as Africans, we should always remember that. Our heritage, celebrate that, um, validate it for ourselves so that our children would also feel validated and not wait for an external person to validate um, what intelligence and beauty um, or what excellence looks like. Yeah, so the conflict about purpose um, and making profits and making a decision immediately on what you want to do versus what you're passionate about. Uh, there are a couple of things to that and one of the philosophies that's helped me think about that is that nothing is supposed to happen immediately. Um, just like we speak in, in Kanea about learning journeys. Um, our professional life is a journey and once you've finished, I think for most people, the end of getting a graduation certificate, possibly your first degree, should be an indicator that you're, you're ready now to receive all the money that's due you for your 18 to 21 years of actually um, learning and that's not the case. Uh, there are multiple philosophies, including African philosophy, that speaks to generations of doing work and then reaping benefits. Um, the biggest thing is this, Personally, I believe that, yes, you do have to do things that, because for all of us to, to have some semblance of happiness on, on the martial order of needs, your, your, your shelter, your food, things have to be taken care of. But for you to be content, not just happy periodically or over a moment, you need to be aligned with your purpose. Um, and for most people, that takes a lot more investment than just you be joining the workforce. That takes a lot more commitment and dedication than just being at a nine to five after a year or two. For most people, and if if you look at it, don't, don't be deceived by a lot of these outlier books of the Mark Zuckerberg or of these, these people who did, yes, by and large, really interesting things, but they are outliers. Most of the time for us to be successful, it takes dedication and years of hard work. When you look at athletes, for example, um, and I was following a couple of them, I know the, the World Cup is, is coming up, so football or rugby players and others, these athletes have dedicated decades of their youth to being professionals, and then they read that. So a lot of times when you ask people about their passion, you ask them, how long have you been committed to that passion for you to, to, to gain, first of all, mastery, not just competence, but mastery, and then for you to be fulfilled and then be rewarded for that. Most people who have gained mastery have committed themselves time and again. It's almost like gravity. You, can, you almost cannot cheat it. There are a few people who are just naturally talented and by chance they get that, but odds are they aren't you and I. Um, so for most people, yes, you do have to start, once you, you're a young professional, start to do things that would bring you money, but always, for your own personal contentment, start to do things that make you happy. Because odds are, 
you would keep doing things that give you contentment over time. And the more you keep doing it, you would gain mastery. And the more you become a master at it, the more you'd be compensated because you would become um, a knowledge person at, at what you do. So it's patience and timing. So my favorite country has to be Ghana. If I don't do that, the black stars will literally kill me. My second favorite, definitely South Africa. Ah, jollof rice. Ghanaian jollof, I definitely don't like Nigerian jollof. Uh, they try, A for efforts, but Ghanaian jollof. Woo! Uh, Manifest. Manifest is Ghanaian. He's not as, as big, but he's done some stuff with Mikasa. Um, he's, he's, he's a really good lyricist. Um, he's not into mainstream stuff, but he was also um, from a Volta region such as uh, I am. Um, he also lived in the States a little bit. His dad was an economist, but he, he puts a lot of himself into the music regardless of uh, what popular acclaim or how many uh, albums he would sell. Uh, so I really relate to him. Um, but then also, um, I really, really like Nasty C. Um, there's a tune of his that I'm always listening to all the time, said. Um, it, 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 Nasty C is on the up and up. He's really one of my, my favorite um, rappers as well. I, I can't sing it though. Uh, I'd have to listen to it. I'm so bad with words. Like, I'm, I'm such a melody person. Like, so, like, I'm humming, I'm, I'm just going. No, 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 no. Oh. Um, up with the weights I work, down with the pack I roll. Um, up for the second, you don't deserve it. Uh, we split the purchase. Feature man said, I need to listen to it and then the words will come to me because I know the melody so well. Yeah. Yeah, I, if, if I play it, the words will literally come out, right? Um, but yes, the set is a eight, so the set is a, is a really good song. Okay, Nasty C, I love you, I promise. Like, I do know your song. Like, this is not... This is not me even faking it. So I work down with the pack, I roll. He deserve it. Yeah, it's with the purchase. Because the preacher man said, yeah, he'll make it anyway. Yeah. And the teacher man said, he won't make it, but he made it anyway. It wasn't easy right now. It's amazing. Yeah. So I do know it. It's just, yeah. It's a great song, though. So, hey.